Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning on this second Sunday in 2012. Glad to have you here. Um, just a couple of, just really a couple of quick announcements. The bulletin announcement about Henrietta Den Hartog is cleared up. Perhaps she had, she swallowed something wrong and, you know, got it out, but she had a day where she was having some trouble breathing and coughing and so forth, but that all cleared up and so she's doing a lot better for which we're thankful. Um, that's the only announcement I have. But this morning we did install and ordain newly elected elders and deacons. And um, I wanted to introduce them to you this morning. They've, uh, they've already been installed to their offices, but um, they are John Boonder and Steve Drenko and Greg Winkle as newly installed and ordained elders. Steve Drenko and Greg are ordained to their office. They've never served as elders before, but they were ordained to this office. John has served as an elder before and uh, was installed to his office. And then Shane Jager, Brad Vanderpaul, and Jamie Van Ruckel uh, were uh, ordained as, as deacons. Jamie has never served as a deacon before, so he was ordained to that office. Oh, Shane, there you are. Uh, I know Brad can't be here. Are you going to worship with us this morning, or are you, you have, you're going? Oh, okay. Well, then come on up here. Oh, you got to help? Well, anyway, I would like to ask you to give your support to these men. Leadership in the church is very important. Um, I, I, in fact, I can't tell you how important it is that we have good, caring leaders, uh, dedicated leaders, and... Um, but we also need the support of the congregation. Uh, leadership is very, very difficult and challenging if you feel like you're bucking the congregation. So I'd like to ask you if you would stand, please, and give these men your support. Members of First Reformed Church, do you receive, in the name of the Lord, these deacons and elders as duly elected and ordained servants of Christ? And do you promise to encourage and pray for them to labor together with them in obedience to the gospel for the unity, purity, and peace of the church, for the welfare of the whole world, and for the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ? If this is your desire, please say, we do, and we ask God to help us. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, men. Congratulations again, and welcome to the Office of Elder and Deacon, and to consistory, and it's not all that bad. We also have another guest with us this morning. Uh, her name is Karen Cossey, and she is with Cherish House, and today we are going to give all of you the opportunity to uh, uh, get to become reacquainted with uh, Cherish House, and to take home with you a baby bottle. Come on up, Karen. Uh, to take home with you a baby, baby, baby bottle, and Karen will explain to you what that's all about. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you as a church body for your generosity in the past. When we have um, come to you and asked for your support for Cherish House, we appreciate it, and everyone at Cherish House um, sends a big thank you to you. There may be some of you who are not familiar with what Cherish House is, so I'd like to share with you um, about what we're all about. It's a maternity home in Spirit Lake that offers help to unwed teens. Has your family or your life been touched by an unplanned pregnancy or an adoption? I know our family has. The crisis of an unplanned pregnancy is very emotional and a very stressful time in the life of a teenage girl and her family. About 10 years ago, a group of individuals saw the need to change the cycle of children raising children. Cherish House opened its doors in March of 2006 with funds that were raised by local individuals and businesses who saw the need and they wanted to make a difference. Cherish House looks much like a typical home. It's a two-story frame building, and there are pictures of it in the back of the church that you can look at. 
It serves as a sanctuary where young women deal with their past and they also prepare for their future. The house is staffed with full-time house parents, Kevin and Patty Johnson, who role model a healthy relationship. Many of the girls that come to the house have never even experienced a healthy family marriage relationship. The girls who come to Cherry's house come from different backgrounds, some from abuse, some from abandonment, but many come from very fine families, but they decide that it's, it's just a time for them to um, set aside to think about what their options are and sort through them so that they can make a wise decision. Each girl receives personal counseling from a professional counselor who's on staff as well as working with local adoption agencies to help her make the very difficult decision of parenting or placing for adoption. They live just like any family, sharing responsibilities as well as learning about consequences, learning to accept no for an answer, personal finances, nutrition, prenatal care. While living at Cherish House, they will attend school or work depending on their individual situation. Each girl is given spiritual support regardless of her church affiliation. She learns in words and in actions that she is precious in God's eyes and that he has a plan for her life. We are seeing gr girls grow uh, and mature academically, socially, and spiritually. This past summer, we had four girls living in the house. Now imagine our house dad, Kevin, with five women, and four of them were pregnant. So it was a very emotional and a very busy time at the house. Three of the girls decided to parent, and one girl decided to place for adoption. And she placed her baby son into the arms of the adoptive parents, very confident that she was making the right decision. We now have uh, four more girls living in the house. One gave birth on Christmas Eve day to a little boy. At Cherry Center, which is located in Milford, we offer a mentor mom program, and I'm one of the mentor moms. That's intended for young women who are pregnant and choose not to live at Cherish House. It's also uh, offered to young moms who are interested in developing their good, good parenting skills. In this program, they earn mommy bucks, which they can use to purchase diapers, clothing, and other baby items that are donated to Cherish Center. We also have Cherished Women, Cherished Kids, which is a group that meets um, at a local church twice a week, excuse me, twice a month, where they have uh, dinner, fellowship with other parents, and education. And this includes free child care for the families. Do you have a heart for girls that are alone and pregnant and young moms? Your help is needed. First of all, we need your prayer support. And you can help us by partnering with us by taking a baby bottle home. And it's funny, I grabbed one of these out of the container in the back of the church, and someone already put a couple bucks in it. So thank you. Um, but take one of these bottles home with you. Uh, put in your loose change, dollar bills, a check if you prefer. Return it on January 29th. There's a reminder on the little card here. You can also put your name and address on the back of the card if you're not receiving our newsletter and we will put you on our mailing list. Um, all the monies that you give to us go directly to Cherish House to support uh, the girls that are living there. We do serve a God of grace and love. We know that there are consequences in life, but out of something difficult, something good can come. And our hope is that during their stay at Cherish House, the girls would begin to understand the love of Christ and a God who loves them unconditionally. I thank you very much for allowing me to share with you in advance for your generosity and for your prayers. God bless. Thanks. Thank you, Karen, and thank you and your husband, Jim, for being here with us this morning. And and uh, have, have a safe journey back up to the lakes. Please do take a baby bottle before you leave today. There's baby bottles here at this exit. There's baby bottles at this exit and in the narthex. And um, again, 
loose change, uh, dollar bills, uh, if you wish simply to write a check to Cherish House, uh, uh, make it out to First Reformed Church, and then put Cherish House in the memo uh, space, and we'll make sure that they get that offering. We will collect that offering on the 29th of this month. Well, let's take a moment to welcome and greet one another, and then let's remain standing for our worship. joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. to 
like to have the boys and girls come and spend a few minutes with me up here on stage for a children's message. How are you guys doing without your mom and dad around? What? How are you doing without your mom and dad? Good. Where are you? What? Where are you? Where, whose house are you at? Good morning. Morning. Lord, thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> well, just find a comfortable place, and then just put your hands in your lap, and or sit on them so they don't move. Okay, and then I'd like to talk to you this morning about our church here. This is our church. This is where you go to church every Sunday, and I need your help. I'd like to you to answer a question. What do you like best 
about our church. Right? Sunday school. You, can you think of anything else besides Sunday school? Yeah. To worship? You like to come to church and worship this, this service? Good for you. How about you? Arts and crafts? How often do you do that? Do you do that in Sunday school? Okay, good. You, you like praising like we just did, our singing, okay? Huh? Coloring. That's kind of artsy and craftsy, yeah? Yes? Yeah, that's, that's, we like doing that, don't we? Faith Weaver Friends, that's a favorite on Wednesday night. You like that too? Yes. Well, now, <clears throat> I'm so glad that you like things in church because church is important. But um, what are we doing here? Why do we come here every Sunday? Why do we go to Faith Weaver Friends? Why do we color? What do we color about? What's this all about? What are we doing here? Yes? We're, what are we doing? We're talking about God and Jesus and all of them. Yeah? Yes, yeah, so what are we doing here? What's it all about? Seeing Jesus. I don't see him, but you know what? I can, I can see him in a smile. I can see him in a, in a song, kind of hear him in a song. Yeah, that good. Yeah, we're here to talk about God and Jesus. Uh, and yes, to believe in Jesus. Anything else? Anybody else have something different? Huh? We love the children in the nursery too, and Jesus loves them too. Yes, yes. It's all about who? It's all about who? It's all about Jesus. He's the most important thing. Now, what's this? Okay. Now I need a mechanical minded girl. A girl that, come on up here, that knows mechanics. Good. Now, I, how do you work this thing? Turn it on. Okay, there's the switch. Everybody know how, the, how a flashlight works? Yeah. Okay, look up here. See this? Everybody? Hey, you guys down there, you see this? There's the switch. And it's been turned on. I got the spotlight on you. Oh, boy, that's bright, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Now, what's inside of here? Okay, how do you get to them? How do you get to those batteries? Oh. Look at that. She is mechanical. You just screw off the top, and out come the batteries. Now, I'm going to put this back together again. <clears throat> Who else thinks they're mechanical? Okay, I want you to turn that flashlight on now. Well, what's the matter here? She must be more mechanical than you are. Huh? Oh, the batteries aren't in there. It won't work without the batteries, will it? All right. Put the batteries back in. Yep, you're pretty mechanical. Okay, <clears throat> the batteries need to be inside this thing in order to work. But now if I left the batteries in and I took this thing out right here, what's that? That's the bulb. Now, if it had the batteries but not the bulb, you could turn that on and it wouldn't work because it needs the bulb. There's two things, most important things in a flashlight, the batteries and the bulb. Without the batteries and the bulb, there's no light. And in the church, without Jesus, there's no reason to come. There's no reason to come to church on Sunday morning. There's no reason to go to Faith Weaver Friends. There's no reason to sing songs. There's no reason to pray. There's no reason if without Jesus. If he's not here and there's no such thing as Jesus, it, there's no reason for it. Do you have a comment? He is our first best friend. Jesus is. Yes. Mateo, do you have something? If, he, if Jesus had never lived, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be here in church. You're, you're right. Yes. Jesus is the most important thing. Now, for the next couple Sundays, I'm going to talk about the most important things in church. Jesus is first. That's what we're going to talk about today. But next week, we're going to talk about another important thing. 
There's two important things in a flashlight, the batteries and the bulb. There's six. We're going to talk about six very important things in the church. So that's what we're going to do the next couple of Sundays. And today, we're talking about Jesus. He's our best friend. He's our Savior. He's the one to whom we pray. Yep. So <clears throat> you listen during my, when I talk a lot, you know, during the sermon. You listen about Jesus. And then the next week, you listen about the next important thing. And then the next week, the next important thing. And pretty, pretty soon, we'll get through them all. Thank you for coming on and helping me out. You were very helpful, and you did a good job with your hands, too. You can go back to your seats now. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise and thank you that you are the eternal God as we begin this new year. It's a new year. It's a new beginning. It's a new start. But you have always existed. You've always been there. And you always will be. You are eternal. And we are temporary. We had a beginning. You created us. We had a beginning, but we act as if we've got all the time in the world and the time is ours to use as we wish. Father, forgive us for being self-centered and for thinking we're in control and for acting that way. And we pray that we will fill this new year with acts of faith and service and giving and helping and encouraging. Thank you for 2011. And thank you now for a new year, 2012, a year of opportunity, a year to spend with our family, another year to serve, another year to give. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the health that you've given us. And we pray that in this coming year, we will remain healthy. And we pray, Heavenly Father, for those who are dealing with health issues, and we especially pray for these little ones that have been born into our congregational family. We pray for Levi Thorson and for Brooke Idema, for these little infants who are in neonatal care. Lord, we pray that they will not only survive, but we pray that they will thrive, that they will grow, that they will gain strength, that their minds will develop and think clearly and that they will grow into healthy, active, normal children. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Mary French, for continued recovery, for continued rehabilitation. We pray for Evelyn Postma, for grace as she moves into Sanford Senior Care, for <clears throat> a measure of health and strength we're grateful that she doesn't hurt, that she's not in pain. We pray for your grace in her life. We pray for Berdina Vandernald, that she will make a full and complete recovery from this surgery. We're so grateful to you, Father, for giving her a good report from her doctors, and it appears that she won't need any further treatment. Thank you for that, Lord God. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the Mission to Haiti team that's left yesterday and we trust they will arrive, or perhaps have already arrived. We pray for safety for them on the job, safety from natural disasters, safety from political problems, safety from crime. We pray for a safe journey when they return home. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they will get a lot accomplished, that they will get much work done. We pray, Lord, that they will have good interaction and uh, relationships with the local people and that they will show in their relationships with them the love of Jesus. Father, we pray for our brother, Lee DeYoung. Lord, we thank you for his faithful service at Words of Hope through these many years. 
And, oh God, we pray that he will continue to be able to serve, that you will raise him up from this bed of illness, and that he will be able to return to his work in full health and strength. Father, we pray for all of those who continue to fight the disease of cancer. And we especially pray for those who have most recently been diagnosed. We pray for Cindy Hofstra as she looks forward soon to surgery. And we pray for Elaine Getzloff as she undergoes tests, consultation with her doctors, and the choice of treatment. Give them strength and grace. Lift their spirits and give their bodies strength to take whatever they need to do to fight this disease. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for hearing our prayers. We offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come together in the name of our God, who is alive and at work in us today. He is the one who has rescued us, has changed us, and we worship him this morning. Will you stand and sing with us?
Thank you. Be seated, please. Our scripture this morning is taken from uh, While the Children Are Excused for Children in Worship. Our scripture is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age, Satan, the God of this age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. As our prayer before the message, let's sing this chorus. You've heard this before, but just a brief review. On March 28 and 29 of 2008, uh, 45 or 50 leaders from this congregation gathered together for a weekend event with Mr. Bob Vanderplatz to seek and discuss, to talk about, think and pray about a new vision of ministry and mission for a first Reformed church. And from that weekend, God led us to the vision we've been pursuing the past three years, bring Nurture, go. Bring people to faith in Christ. Nurture them in that faith. And then we all go together to bring more people to faith in Jesus. But we did something else that weekend that hasn't gotten the same emphasis. People don't know about it. Perhaps they haven't been told about it as much. Didn't get as much emphasis as this vision. We talked about our core values. Our core values. What's the most important thing uh, that defines us as a congregation, what sets us apart, like the flashlight illustration I used with the children, what are the most important things that we can't do without, the things that make us who we are, the reason that we exist, the heart and soul of First Reformed Church. And that's what we're going to be talking about these next six weeks. We identified six core values. And uh, the first of those core values is the one we're going to talk about today, and that is that we are Christ-centered. Christ-centered. So what does that mean when we say we're Christ-centered? Well, it means that we proclaim Jesus Christ, not ourselves. Verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 4 says, we, and this is the Apostle Paul talking to the believers in Corinth, and he's talking about himself and the other apostles. He says, we do not preach ourselves, 
but rather we preach Jesus Christ as Lord. How might we preach or proclaim ourselves as a congregation? You know, we do not preach ourselves. How might we? What do we have to watch out for? What do we have to avoid in preaching ourselves? Well, we must not preach about ourselves or about our church. It's not about our church. It's about Jesus. Now, we've got a, I believe, a good church. We've got a solid church. Um, I think we hold our own very well in a community that doesn't really grow, that we hold our own as far as num numerical growth. Um, I, I, this is a very generous congregation. It's been very blessed financially. We're in good shape financially. We are a congregation that I, appears to enjoy each other. We get along well with one another. We like to be together. Um, we're a, a church that supports missions. We're strong with missions. There's a lot about our church that we can be enthused and excited about, and that's all good. We should be. We want to be enthused about our congregation. But it's not about the church. And so sometimes we might find ourselves inviting people to come to church, and indeed I want us to invite people to come to church. But we need to try to attain another level here. It's good to invite people to come to church because that's a good thing. But it's better to introduce people to Jesus. It's more necessary to introduce people to Jesus Christ. If we invite them to the church and they don't have a good experience or maybe people aren't as friendly to them as they think they should be or perhaps someone in the church offends them or perhaps the pastor offends them, you know, they can leave the church. They're done with the church. And there's plenty of people that have. It's not about the church. It's about Jesus. We do not preach ourselves. We do not preach our church. Come to our church. It's a good church. You'll like our church. It's about the one whom we proclaim. We need to attain that next level. It's good to invite people to church, but it's better to introduce them to Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, the Apostle Peter says, In your hearts, members of the church, followers of Jesus Christ, set Christ apart as Lord, and always be prepared, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have and do it with gentleness and respect. Why do we go to church? What's it all about? Why do we have hope in the midst of difficulties? Why do we, when we lose a loved one, go to church and have a funeral service? And what do we talk about? What's our hope? Always be ready to tell people the hope that you have. That's Jesus. That's our faith in Jesus. Now, every single one of us needs to be thinking that way. It's good. Invite people to church. But also try to achieve that next level. Introduce them to Jesus. We do not preach ourselves. We do not preach our church. And we do not preach our staff. Now, it's good for a church to have a great staff. You want to have a good staff. You want to have a staff that's capable, <coughs> a staff that people love to follow, a staff that people trust. You want that in a church. In fact, a church won't prosper unless you have a quality staff. And we've all heard this before. We've all heard of churches that perhaps have a fantastic youth director or they have perhaps a, a fantastic music and worship leader or a fantastic Christian education director. And people say, oh, you've just got to come to our church. Our youth ministry is beyond compare. Our youth director has got the greatest personality. you just got to come to our church because you got to meet this person. We do not proclaim. We're not here to proclaim our staff. It's about Jesus Christ. I think about John the Baptist. And when we read the story of John the Baptist in the Gospels, John comes along and he begins preaching and he preaches out in the wilderness and he attracts 
huge crowds of people. They're flocking to him because he's preaching with power and conviction. He's baptizing people by the hundreds. Crowds are exploding. John the Baptist is drawing people like crazy. But then along comes Jesus. And people begin to trickle away from John the Baptist and follow Jesus. And John the Baptist's followers come to him and say, hey, what's this business? This Jesus is coming along and our people are leaving and going to him. What does John the Baptist say? Yeah, I know it. Man, got to compete with this guy. No. In John chapter 3, verse 30, John says, he must become greater, I must become less. It's not about the staff. The staff isn't the star of the show at First Reformed Church. It's Jesus. He must become greater, even if it means that we become less. So we do not preach ourselves. We do not preach our church. We do not preach our staff. And we do not preach our programs. Now we want good programs. We want good staff. We want a great church. But that's not the message. Faith Weaver Friends, it's great. We love it. Kids love it. Wednesday night, come to Faith Weaver Friends. Yes, good. We want that. Youth ministry, programs for young adults, young families, married people, programs, uh, classes, whatever, support groups for those that are going through divorce or have lost a loved one. We want good programs. But the point is not the program. The point is Jesus. Now, hopefully, all of those programs focus on Jesus and they revolve around Jesus, but the point is Jesus Christ. We do not proclaim our programs. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, what specifically does that mean? We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. We do not preach about ourselves, our church, our staff, our programs, our finances, our missions, our, our short-term missions, cutting down trees for people. All, it's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. What about Him? Well, we read in this uh, passage of Scripture in verse 4 that Christ is the image of God. He is God incarnate. That's what we believe about Jesus Christ. He's not just a good man. He's not just a moral teacher. He's not just someone that came along and did some wonderful things and now he's dead, but we remember. No. He is God in human flesh. He lived among us for 33 years. He left a body of teachings, but he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he promised that he would come again. He is God in human flesh. That's what we proclaim about Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of groups that will proclaim that Jesus Christ is a good man and a moral teacher, but that he's not God. We teach Jesus Christ is God. (laughs) He is the only Savior of the world. Jesus. What does it mean? Jesus. It's not just a name. It's got meaning. Jehovah saves We just came through Christmas. Mary and Joseph were commanded to call their son Jesus. You shall call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins. Jehovah saves. He's the Savior. He's the only Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's our proclamation. Jesus Christ is the only Savior of your world. Your only hope for salvation from sin is Jesus Christ. That's our proclamation. He's the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. Christ is the Greek term for the Hebrew Messiah, which simply means the one sent by God to redeem the world. He is God sent to redeem the world from sin, to redeem the world from the curse of sin, from the pain of sin, from the trouble, the disappointment, the heartache of sin. Jesus came to deliver us from that. He's the Christ. He's the promised one. He's the one that would be sent For our Jewish brothers and sisters, they're still looking for a Messiah. If we ever run into a Jewish brother and sister, we can tell them, hey, Jesus of Nazareth, whose birthday we celebrate on Christmas, he's the Messiah. He's the one you're looking for. That's our proclamation. He is Lord. 
He calls the shots. He's the king of kings. He's the head honcho. He's the boss. It's not what I want to do. It's what he wants me to do. It's not my desires. It's his desires. It's not the direction that I want to go in life or the path that I want to take in life. It's the path that he would have me to walk in life. He knows me best. He created me, and he created me for a purpose. What purpose is that? I have to seek that, not the purpose that I dream up for myself. His purpose. He's Lord. Now, Jesus himself said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, oh, Lord, Lord. Not everyone who says that shall enter the kingdom of God, but only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. He's the Lord. We must do His will for our lives. And He is the light of the world. God said, let the light shine out of the darkness. God made His light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He's the light of the world. Now, I know it looks light out there, and it is light in physical light. But the world has been cursed. There's death, there's disease, there's natural disasters. And it's going on all the time. Darkness symbolizes that. Jesus is the light that's come into this world. He died, but He rose again as a symbol. He's conquered death. He's conquered the curse of sin. And it's going to be conquered in our lives too. That's our message. He's the light of the world. Now how can we proclaim this? How can you pro proclaim this? Yeah, I've got the opportunity to preach sermons on Sunday, but you don't do that. So how can you proclaim Jesus? Not yourself, not your church, not your pastor or your staff at your church, not your, not your programs at the church, but how can you proclaim Jesus Christ? Now, you might be already thinking, well, I don't need to do that. This is just more preacher talk. Um, I'm a Christian. I go to church. I don't need to proclaim Jesus. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. I shine through you. You are my witnesses. If he's Lord, we can't sit there and say, well, I'll just ignore this part of the message. How can I proclaim the message? I'm not going to do it. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, following means doing what he says. And he says, you are my witnesses. You are the light of the world. And I'm living inside of you and my light shines through you. You've got to do this. You've got to proclaim me. Not yourself, not your church, but me. How can you do that? How can we proclaim Him? You know, for the past three years, we've been working on this vision for ministry and mission, and one of the prongs of this vision is to go, to go out into the world. And one of the um, aspects of that is that we've been emphasizing learning our personal testimony so that we can share with others what Jesus Christ means to us. It's a personal thing. It's not theological. It's not Bible talk. It's simply telling people the difference that Jesus has made in my life, in your life. Testimony. Shelly uh, Hogers has put together a fantastic testimony workshop. Anybody who's ever gone to it has said the same story. Um, I go in there not knowing exactly what to say. I don't know what my testimony is. And they come out, and they've got a clear picture. And they're kind of excited about it. And every testimony I've ever listened to of all the people that have gone through it, I've always been inspired. But after three years, in a congregation of over 600 people, we've had 50 people attend that workshop. Now look, it's available. It's there for us. And the purpose is to enable us, to help us tell people about Jesus. Now, we've got two years left in this vision process, but beyond that, we've got the rest of our lives. How are we going to tell people about Jesus? Not our church, not our programs, not our pastor, but Jesus. 
tell them what Jesus means to you. Well, I don't know how to do that. I, I don't know what to say. Go to the workshop. It's available. Do it. Get off your butts and do it. I know you're busy. I know you are. But make it a priority. He's the Lord. And I don't mean to be offensive by saying get off your butts, implying that you're lazy. I know you're not. You're involved in all kinds of things. But make this a priority. Your testimony. What does Jesus mean to me? How has Jesus been a positive, made a positive difference in my life? That's one way. Another way is to learn a method of sharing the good news that Jesus saves, that Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus came to change my life, to make it better. There's all kinds of methods, the four spiritual laws, the bridge illustration, the ABCs. You know, I, I gave you some years ago that little green card with the ABCs of salvation, and I said, stick it in your pocket and use it sometime. You learn a simple method of sharing what the gospel is. So if someone ever says to you, what is this business? Why do you go to church? What's, what is a Christian? You've got something to show them. And once again, it takes some effort to learn this thing, to get a little bit of self-confidence in it. You know, when I get up in front of church in the morning and install elders and deacons, I don't just get up there and wing it. I do a little preparation. I think about what I'm going to say. I read some things. I know what I'm going to read. You prepare. You get yourself ready. Well, when you talk to someone about Jesus, you don't just wing it. You kind of get some ideas in your head. It's called preparation. Learn a method. And just tell people stories of Jesus' faithfulness in your life. Simple stories, everyday stories Real stories of how you see Jesus at work in your life. Simple things. When Gene and I go to Michigan, as we just did, when we leave the Parsonage driveway and start heading down Washington Avenue, we start praying, Lord, give us a safe journey. Let the car run safely. Keep the tires inflated. Keep the animals out of our way. Don't let us have any accidents. And then when we get there, we say, thank you, Lord, for a safe journey. Then when we leave Michigan to come back here, we do the same thing on the opposite direction. And when we get here, we say, thank you, Lord. Now, we pray and ask God to give us a safe journey. And when we get here safely, that's an answer to that prayer. And that's a simple story of how Jesus blesses us. Now, you can say, but that, everybody does that. That's not just Jesus. I mean, an unbeliever can have a safe journey. But that's our story. That's what we believe. And that's something that we can share with people. The ministry and mission of First Reformer Church is not about our church. It's not about our staff. It's not about our programs. It's not about our finances. It's not about our mission trips. It's about Jesus Christ. Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Do you talk with him? Do you listen to him talk with you? That's a personal relationship. And do you do the best you can to follow him as the Lord of your life? He is what First Reformed Church is all about. That's what this worship service is all about. Any worship service is what it's about. It's what our staff is working to promote. We're working to promote Jesus, not ourselves. Jesus Christ is what our programs is all about. We are Christ-centered. We do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves, the people of First Reformed Church, are servants of Jesus Christ for the sake of others. Let us pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus into the world. Thank you for having someone somewhere along the way having, introducing him to us. And I pray that every person in this sanctuary will not just put this message aside, but that every one of us will look for ways that we can be promoters of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. You are holy, you are faithful. 
proud to be a congregation that is Christ-centered because He is the greatest. And we're proud to be His servants and to promote His name. So I hope in that spirit that you will leave the sanctuary this morning. Go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. next week.